Top of the morning. Glad that all of you are here this morning. We get to gather together. I'm excited about being here. Uh, those that are kind of, uh, online, uh, I think there's a few that, that still join us, and we're thankful that they're here too. Um, but I just want to have a prayer with you, and uh, may the Lord be honored in everything that we do here today. Let's pray together. Father, we come before you, and we want to uh, acknowledge your presence. Um, your presence is here uh, not because uh, not because we have uh, made ourselves good. It's because you are kind, and we thank you for that. Thank you that you not only uh, fill the whole earth and the and and, and you. Uh, Above the heavens, uh, but you promised to never leave us. We pray your blessing upon everything that we do, and uh, we thank you for Jesus. In his name, amen. Amen. As Don said, welcome. I want to welcome all of you here, especially those on TV, and certainly hope to see those of you that are watching us live in person. So, we have a lot of things coming up soon, especially the Holy Week services. We have a Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and of course Easter. Those will be uh, good services as well as we're bringing back the uh, sunrise service. We want you to know we are busy planning and, and preparing for the Holy Week uh, services. Also today, just a little housekeeping and a little note. Uh, Marion Campbell has a birthday party that will be coming up. And there will be a card circulating today for each of you to sign. So if you could sign that card as it comes through and let Miriam know how much we appreciate her. I'm glad to have Miriam back. I'm not going to tell how old she is, but if you want to ask me off the microphone, I can tell you because I do know she's the same age as my mother would have been. So they were big buddies. So anyway, my soul, praise the Lord. Lord, my God, you are very great. Let's all stand. We'll begin the service with hymn number 24. Oh, worship the King. Let everyone bless God and 
sing his praises, for he holds our lives in his hand. He holds our feet to the path. Blessed be God, who did turn away when I was afraid, and didn't you refuse me this time to love. Thank you, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven, and the dead in Christ will rise first. This is an old hymn. I know all of you have heard it. I hope that you'll sing it. When the roll is called up yonder, I will be there. Father, it is uh, so good that we get to gather together today. Um, your kindness to us uh, is beyond words. And Father, we, uh, we want to uh, see Jesus, and we want others to see him. And I pray that you would help me and you'd help all of us to live in such a way and talk in such a way that, that others would want him to. Father, um, we think about the needs within our country, our leaders, um, just the difficulties that they have. I pray that you'll give them wisdom. I pray that you will uh, watch out for them. Father, we think of what's going on around the world atrocities that are going on, um, we have no control over it, but you do. And 
Father, I know that you're doing things in the world, and uh, it seems to me that one of them, it seems that one of them is that people would uh, realize that we cannot trust in man. We cannot trust in princes or kings or presidents, but we can only trust in you. And so we pray that you will show yourself. Lord, give wisdom to the leaders of the world. Father, um, we get to pray together this great prayer, and I pray that you'll help us to have the same spirit of this prayer, which is if we'll pray together. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Churches that celebrate it quarterly, biannually, annually. Some do it when the uh, the mood hits them. Hey, let's have communion next Sunday or whatever. It's not. It's not real structured. We have a very structured communion. And when I look at our worship service, and, and Sally and Robin and I work on this weekly, communion should be a high point of it. Why is communion a high point? Well, it's pretty simple. We don't deserve what Jesus did for us, and yet he did it anyway. And he knew we didn't deserve it, yet he, he did it anyway. I'm very thankful for that, and I hope that each and every Sunday this does not get stale, but it instead brings us to the point where we remember the sacrifice that was made as we go into the Holy Week, uh, which Easter is a little bit later this year. It's April 17th. We have been looking at Monday, Thursday, Good Friday. Monday, Thursday service that we have is going to be a very dark service. Jesus was betrayed. But he knew right then, I'm going to go to the cross and die for people that don't really care for me. For a world that will, in the end, turn against me. And I'm going to be crucified. But on Sunday, when you come back from the Thursday, Friday services, you'll see the good news that Jesus did rise again. I hope that communion is always a high point for you. And I hope that you never forget the sacrifice that was made. I think Jim does a very good job of presenting communion. And we used to just do communion where the elder would say something, a prayer or whatever. But I think Jim does a good job of reminding us from week to week the sacrifice that was made. Let us break bread together on our knees. Hymn number 399, we'll sing verses 1 and 2.
simple says we love be because God first loved us such a simple short thing I can almost remember that I don't have the gift for remembering scripture like I wish I did but as simple as it is it's so profound <clears throat> it's still hard for me to understand that God loves us so much he loved us from the beginning and he sure will love us to the end right. my prayer this morning is that I should love, that I could love God as much as he loves me. What we call the Last Supper was the time that Jesus Christ des desired to have supper with his disciples, his last meal. Towards the end of the meal, after lots of prayer, lots of study, probably answers uh, or questions asked and answers given, Toward the end of that meal, Jesus took from the table just simple bread. Breaking that bread, he says, this represents my body. My body is to be broken for you. Take it, eat. Likewise, Jesus took the cup, and after blessing the cup, he says, this represents my blood. My blood is to be shed for you for the forgiveness of sin, for the sins of your sin and the sins of the world. Take it, drink. <laughs>
thank you this morning for being able to worship you. Thank you for being with us, protecting us, providing for us. We ask, Lord, that you'll bless the gifts that were given today, that you'll multiply it and use it for your own benefit, for the good of the kingdom. Father, open our hearts as we prepare to hear your word. Bless our pastor as he preaches it. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Be seated. At 7.27 a.m., I sent the following text message out. I was planning on singing the solo today, but I'm a little hoarse. Would you be able to sing something today? <laughs> I sent that to Joe. I got back to you what, about 9? Yeah, Joe got back to me about 9 o'clock. Yes. That's all he said, yes. That's all I needed to hear. We have a very small choir at this point, and we will grow it. But the voices that we have are very good. So the kind of voices in each section that you build around. I could have made that call to anybody. Robin could even sing a solo, but she just doesn't like to. She has a very nice voice, but she just does not like solos. I'm very thankful for those people that stand behind me each week. Last week, so many of you complimented me on how good the choir sounded, and I gladly took all the, oh yeah, wow, we were great, but they are very good, and I'm very thankful to have them, and I want you to know that we are working hard to build this choir around people like Joe. And we want to enhance worship and give God the due praise that he has deserved. So, Joe, thank you so much for bailing me out. And I can't wait to hear what you have to say. Well, David, I think you're an upstanding guy. You don't resemble a little horse at all. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. But I'm happy to sing. If you want to follow along, I'm going to sing number 254 from the hymnal. Wow. Where are you there? Wow.
Let's pray together. Wow. Uh, the, some of those thoughts um, are worth uh, many hours of a day to think about. Um, our time on this planet uh, is so brief, so short. And uh, we we actually don't have enough time to learn how much that you love us. And we don't have time to learn how much you've done for us. So Father, teach us what you've done. Teach us the power of Thank you. Thank you, Father. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And so how right is it that we take the time to watch Christ and we listen to him? In uh, this passage, we, uh, we have something stated in verse 15 that I think is pretty significant. Where he says, be aware alert about the leaven of the Pharisees and Herod. Be aware of the leaven. Leaven often in the Bible is, uh, is, 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 a, is a symbol of sin. Um, for example, during Passover, one of the things they, the children of Israel did was that they had, they had to get rid of all the leaven uh, not only away from their food, away from the bread, but they were to get it out of the home during that week because it resembled sin. And Jesus told the, his disciples to be aware of the leaven of the most religious people that anybody knows and Herod. And so, the title of the message then is, Be Aware of Those Who Influence You. Be aware of them. The Bible has a lot to say about that. It's, it says things like um, anger is one of those things. If you're around somebody who's angry, Proverbs says, then you could become angry. It says if, uh, if bitterness is set in, that that it, it defiles others. Um, but, but not only that, we find that um, you and I are very easily influenced. We've talked about things like our, our accent, right? Uh, it's interesting how, how much of a southerner you guys would be if you were to go up into the north they would recognize right away, and you're going, no, oh, no, you guys have the accent, I don't. Uh, accents are very, uh, you know, are very telling about where people are from, aren't they? Um, I know that I picked it all up coming here, not having been here long, and ended up having a bit of an accent. Clothing is another one of those things that show us how easily influenced we are. I remember as a, I remember uh, when uh, the, the, the jeans that have all the holes in them, and, and I thought, at first, I thought, that's kind of embarrassing, you know, because when I was a kid, I was embarrassed with the holes in my jeans, and now I like them. You know, when people wear them, I think, oh, did you get some new jeans? Uh, it's interesting how all that works, but we are really easily influenced in our lives. Um, in fact, Ecclesiastes 1 actually says, it actually says that, uh, you know, pr pretty much we're all going to be forgotten one day. I mean, you know, but your influence is going to last for generations. And you have to think about that. So it's not only really it's about, you know, wh who are you allowing to influence you? It is said that you uh, have, uh, you will meet uh, 
not just by, by way of, uh, of a name, but you will actually be around between 2,000 and 80,000 people in your lifetime if you live to be at least 80 years old. So if you can think about that, you're influencing people. In fact, they also say, and I, these are studies, they also say that, that you have anywhere from 7 to 15 people watching you at any given time. I think that that's very true. And so we stop and we evaluate that um, uh, about, you know, that you and I would not be the leaven that would corrupt uh, those around us. You see, really, what we're going to talk about for a few minutes is um, as we read the passage, it's very rich, it's all of it's rich, and we're not going to be able to get, glean everything out of these 21 verses, but you can as you read it. Um, but there are several things about, about the influences that we want and don't want there. For example, when you look at Christ, he, ex he says to these guys that I have compassion. In other words, the compassion is the idea that you, that you feel what other people are feeling. You care about what's going on with someone else. Um, it's not a matter of me deciding and t telling, asking, you know, finding out from you whether you have the right amount of compassion. It's about me looking at myself and you looking at yourself. And so we evaluate that. Um, and then secondly, in the passage, there's, there are those that apparently it appears that they're so, they're so, um, uh, enamored or so uh, so overtaken by the things that Christ is teaching that 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 they they, they, they don't eat that the, their hunger for God their hunger for the Word of God actually uh, causes them to where there's, uh, you know, there's no real appeal for physical needs. And thirdly, really, is beware of those who have made themselves uh, of greater authority than the, than the Word of God instead of being shaped by it. Hey, now watch it. Let's just read this together. Uh, Brandon, if we can bring that passage up and we'll talk about it. Um, in those days, the multitude being very great and having nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to him and said to them, I have compassion on the multitude because they have now continued with me three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their own houses, they will faint on the way, for some of them have come from afar. Then his disciples answered him, How can one satisfy these people with bread here in the wilderness? He asked them, How many loaves do you have? And they said, Seven. So he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground, and he took the seven loaves, and he gave thanks. He broke them and gave them to his disciples to set before them, and they set and and they set them before the multitude. They also had a few small fish, and having blessed them, he said to them also before, set them also before them. So they ate and were filled, and they took up seven large baskets of leftover fragments. Now those who had eaten were about 4,000, and he sent them away. Immediately he got into the boat with his disciples and came to the region of down. Manutha, which we don't know where exactly that is. And the Pharisees came out, began to dispute with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven, testing him. But he sighed deeply in the spirit, and he said, why does this generation seek a sign? Assuredly, I say to you, no sign shall be given to this generation. And he left them and getting into the boat again departed to the other side. 
And now the disciples had forgotten to take bread, and they did not have more than one loaf with them in the boat. Then he charged them, saying, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they reason among themselves, saying, It is because we have no bread. But Jesus, being aware of it, said to them, Why do you reason because you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive nor understand? Is your heart still hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember? broke the five loaves for the five thousand. And how many baskets full of fragments did you take up? They said, twelve. Also, when I broke the seven of their, uh, the four thousand, how many large baskets full of fragments did you take up? And they said, seven. Verse 21 says, so he said to them, how is it you don't understand? It's very interesting because he had this uh, desire that they would understand what? Who he was. He wanted them to know who he was. Who else could feed 5,000 plus women and children uh, with uh, five loaves and two fishes? Who else could feed 4,000 uh, with seven loaves and a few fishes? Who else could do this? <laughs> Would he really have gotten on to them because uh, they only had one loaf? <laughs> Do they know who he is? You see, these uh, Pharisees just came to trick him. They came to set him up. They wanted to uh, somehow get the people to see um, that they shouldn't be following him. They wanted him set up kind of like Satan. You see, but Jesus shows something to us that is so special. Because remember, whenever Jesus was tempted, for example, in Matthew chapter 4, when he was tempted to, uh, by Satan to turn a rock into bread, he didn't do it. He showed us something. He showed us something that, that I have to evaluate myself on. You see, he thought of others before himself. He thought of others before himself. You see, he didn't turn the rock, the stone into bread, though he could have. He didn't. But he cared about the needs of these people. You see, really, when he did these miracles was not to show off. He did them giving authenticity to his message. You see, in fact, when he rose from the dead, I don't know about you, but when he rose from the dead, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15 that he didn't, that he didn't uh, go and show all the unbelievers that he was raised from the dead at all. Doesn't that shock you? It shocks me. You know, uh, there's a lot of things I might have done uh, that be, be thankfully that I'm not, not him. Uh, but but <clears throat> he he only showed himself to believers. I think that's unique. I think that's important for us to remember. You see. He said in another place in Matthew, he says that uh, I am not going to show a sign to a wicked and adulterous generation. Isn't that interesting? That's what he said. And so, by the way, you and I don't need to uh, look for signs. He's given you and I more than enough. The creation itself, the Bible says that men are without excuse just because of creation. That's it. He's given you more than enough to subject yourself to one who created the worlds. But far more than that, 
We have stuff here that is so amazing. In fact, the Bible uses, it uses this terminology. It says that the scriptures were inspired by God, were God-breathed. And so we can read this book and we can gather truth from it that can increase our faith by many times over. And so we read and we learn things and we see what he did and it causes our faith to grow. And so we want to be around someone like this. How is it that I possibly could have compassion like this? How it would be to be with him and to learn from him, you see. You know, there's a book entitled The Master Plan of Evangelism. And uh, uh, it is, uh, it's, it's uh, Col Robert Coleman uh, wrote this book. And man, what a spiritual giant uh, that he was. But his whole, uh, I, uh, his whole uh, work that he focused on for his entire life was the master's plan for evangelism. What it was, it's spending time with people, teaching them about the things of God and leading them toward himself. And so, I don't know about you, but think about who the greatest influences are in your life. Who are those that are influencing you the most? By the way, we're all influenced by so many things around us. I know I, I've been talk, I, I talked to someone who, um, they, when they watch television, they watch certain shows, and they talk to me about them as if they are people, and they live down the street, and they talk about them as if it's really going on. <laughs> It's so funny to listen. I said, you know they're not real, right? And, oh, yeah, I do, but you know, so-and-so, they, okay. Um, but, but I think of two people that are, that are probably right now the most, the most, have been the most influential. I could use my two brothers. I wish that you had met them here. You will get to meet them there. Uh, pretty cool guy really influenced me a lot. But um, R.C. Sproul and uh, J.I. Packer, R.C. Sproul, the reason why R.C. Sproul so inspires me, and J.I. Packer, I read his book, Knowing God, back when I was a young Christian, back when I was probably about 16 or 17 years old, called Knowing God. The reason why they inspire me and, and the influence that they have in my life is because they are so saturated by the scriptures. They are so saturated by the scriptures. And oh, how I want that. And oh, how I want to have his compassion. I want that. And so I've had to evaluate my own selfishness in life. They don't evaluate that. And do you know that I'm probably going to, I'm certain, I'll be evaluating that my entire life. Because the Bible teaches us, Jesus taught us, he says, take up your cross. Take up your cross. Take up yours. And come follow me. That's the way to live. You and I are never going to find, we're never going to find happiness in life if we're going to keep pursuing stuff for me, for yourself. Never going to find, you're going to keep, that's going to be your constant pursuit. You're never going to find it. Where are you going to find it? You're going to find it. We finally give in and say, Christ, you're, you're more important to me, more enjoyable to me, more satisfying to me than anything the world has to offer. But Paul said in, in, in Galatians 6.14, he says, the world's crucified for me. It's crucified to me. <laughs> and I'm to the world. <laughs> I'm to the world. I don't really care for me either. 
But you see, for these things to occur is for us to watch him and to be with him. Well, not only was there a divine compassion that was driven by so much more than a fleeting feeling, but it overtook him. Secondly, if you'll bring up the second point, I know I already went over the first one. Uh, there are those who are so hungry. There are those who are so enamored by the word of God that even physical needs can become unimportant. Stay with me now. They were there for three days. And then Jesus knew they were hungry. Uh, there are those, there are times, I don't know if you've ever been there, where you're so hungry for the scriptures that, that literally food does not have the same pull on you. Let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, Job 23.12 is kind of cool. If you'll just bring that up and we'll just move right on. But Job 23.12 says, Job, Job says this, I have not departed from the commandments of his lips. <laughs> I've treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. I love it. There's a guy by the name of Jonathan Edwards. Now, understand that this, I'm going by memory right now. Uh, I read a book one time. It was about the women in the lives of these great men. And, of course, these women were great women. And uh, one of them, I believe it was Jonathan Edwards, whose wife, uh, uh, Jonathan, by the way, uh, Jonathan Edwards, uh, I was told by a professor, and I've read this in other places, but uh, the professor said this, an atheist professor uh, said this, Dr. Greenwald, he, he professed to be an atheist, and uh, 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 Dr. Greenwald said that Jonathan Edwards was the most brilliant mind America ever produced, and I've, I've read that in other places as well. But what he was, he spent so much time in his study, he just spent so much time there that, uh, that, that, that he would lock his door and his wife would come and knock on the door and say, hey, food, you know, we're going to eat, eat. Come, you know, come eat. And he wouldn't answer her so that she wouldn't, he wouldn't, she wouldn't know that he's there. So he just wouldn't answer her. And so he'd knock, she'd knock and knock and try. Finally, she, finally, she took the door off the hinges so that he couldn't shut his door anymore. Uh, but I love that. I think that's so cool. I do. Uh, but, but, but just that hunger for the scriptures was so, so prevalent. And that's the way it was with these guys. By the way, I just need to make a note here. Um, in John chapter 6, after he had fed the 5,000, um, Jesus began to teach about how that he was the bread and he was he uh, to eat of his flesh and eat of his drink of his blood. And there were many that left. They were hungry for a while. And then they weren't hungry. There are those that, 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 that before Jesus, a week before Jesus went to the cross, they said, they said, uh, they, they, they wanted him to be a king. They, they, they put down the, the palm branches and they put down their coats and, and allowed him to walk across that with this donkey. And, and, and they, then, then a week later, they're saying, crucify him. I don't want to be one of those. Do you? I don't want to be one of those that, 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 that's hungry for him for a little while. But then when things don't go exactly right or my life changes or things happen, I don't want to be one of those that walks away. I want to walk toward him. And so, so, so what we see here is, is that there, is, there are those people who have a divine compassion within their soul. There are those who have a hunger for the word of God, that it just, just like that passage in, in Job, that he just, he is, his, uh, he hung on the words of God. Well, the last point that I want to make is, uh, is uh, number three, if you'll thank you, friend. Beware of those who have made themselves of greater authority than the word of God rather than being shaped by it. You see, I want my thoughts to be governed by him. I want my 
uh, I want my life to be shaped and moved by him. Uh, bring up Isaiah 64, 8, and I'm going to refer to another passage, Ephesians 2, 10, you guys are familiar with. But now, O oh Lord, which is sovereign one, you are our father. We are the clay, and you are our potter, and all we are the work of your hand. Can you say that? I'm not telling you to say that. But can you say Do you want to say that? God, I want you to shape my life. God, I want you to shape my thoughts. I want to somehow become more like your son. And by the way, that's a really big prayer because it means that there's certain things that are going to be cut out of our lives and there are going to be certain things that are going to have to be added into our lives for us to become more and more like him. Look at Psalm 1, verses 1 through, let's just do 1 through 3. It says, the way of the righteous, oh, by the way, that's not the scriptures. I got all mixed up in the earlier service. I thought, I thought I had the wrong version. But anyway, verse one, blessed is the man who walks not, now watch that, walks, you see that? Not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands, so you got walking and then standing, in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. So what is that? Then verse 3 says, oh, excuse me, thank you. But his delight, what? Is in the law of the Lord. And in his law he meditates. Day and night, verse 3 then says, he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. But I want you to think with me for just a moment. In other words, it's, it's, it's walking, then it's standing, and then it's sitting. It's kind of like, um, you know, the, the, you, you think about the people that you're walking with. Now, I'm not telling you, listen, I, gotta, I, gotta, I have to tell you that uh, I want to meet as many people as I can in my lifetime. I do. I want to meet as many people as I can. I, I want to I meet as many as I can. But the people that influence us, the ones that you walk with, or the ones that you sit down with and you learn from, and you are influenced by. Oh, then it even goes to the point where it says, it says not only those who you walk with and those who you sit, sit with, excuse me, stand with, but then all of a sudden you're sitting with them, the scornful. You know what those are? You know what the scornful is? The judges. They're the ones who uh, kind of know more than God. They know more than God. And, uh, and, and, but then it says, but, right? Verse two, that we would meditate day and night. So what's the influence? What's the influence? The scriptures. The scriptures. You see, I want to try to close here in just a moment with these last final thoughts. You see, the leaven which is what Jesus told them to be careful about. What is the leaven of the Pharisees? The leaven of the Pharisees are those people that have traditions that are above the word of God. This is our tradition. Traditions can be fantastic, but not when it takes precedence. What is the what is the the, the, the leaven of the Pharisees is that they, they put rules on people that God didn't. They put rules on people that they don't live up to themselves. They worship God with their mouth, but their heart isn't given to Him. They pretend. There's an image. What, what about Herod? What about Herod? What is the leaven of Herod? Pleasing everybody. That, wouldn't that be terrible to be, excuse, I mean, I, that's the wrong word. I didn't mean to use that word. Wouldn't it be difficult to be a politician? <laughs> oh my gosh, God, please everybody? Mm, man, that would be tough. But you know, we don't have very many statesmen anymore. Oh, we've got some. We've got some. We don't have a lot. 
where uh, it seems many of them just want many of them just want uh, to keep their power. So they please this one, they please this one, they please. No, I don't want to live like that. I don't want to. I don't want to live like that. You know, I, I have to tell you that uh, being a pastor sometimes is difficult. I'll tell you why. Because I want everybody happy. I do. I, I want everybody happy. Because um, I think we have a lot of reason to be happy. Um, uh, and so, the authority here is never me. We know that. I'm good with that. I'm more, I'm, I can't tell you how comfortable I am with that. I need that. I don't want to be the authority. Um, I love the fact that we have a board. Um, I believe that the Bible teaches there needs to be a plurality in leadership and not just one man. I believe that. <laughs> um, but I don't think you all would want me at any time to not teach the Bible as it is. That I wouldn't compromise. I don't think you need me to do that. I need you to understand that um, the judgment for those who teach the Word of God have a greater judgment. And so, in closing, who influences you the most? Who do you want to influence you the most? Let's pray. Father, um, help us to be different. Help us to uh, Help us to be the most caring church in Jonesboro. As we, as we look to you as the final authority, as the leader of this church. We want Christ to build it. I thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to sing together. Page 604. If God spoke to you, you want to pray? I'd love to pray with you. Delighted that you're here this morning. And uh, stand with us, please. Now we gather at the river, another very familiar hymn. I'll hear you sing. children's choir back and children's uh, activities. So if you know of children that you would like to invite or bring, we would love to have them here. All right. Thanks so much. And we will pray and be dismissed. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for worship.
Father, help each of us as we leave to be the people that you would have us to be. Bring us all back safely. We'll be careful to give your name all the praise. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.